What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Kind of Funny X Cast, your home for all things Xbox. Of course, I'm one of your hosts, Snowbike Mike. And if you're watching over on the YouTube side of things, you'll probably notice I don't have either one of my gaming dads here today. And if you're listening, don't worry. We got a really fun episode coming your way. Of course, I will be joined by Paris Lily and Andrew Renee on the back half of today's episode to talk all things Xbox. But the first half, you get a very special one because I get to sit down one on one with with the head of all things Diablo, Rod Ferguson, will be on the show from Blizzard Entertainment to talk Diablo 4 and his reactions to all the positive reviews coming your way for this awesome game releasing later this week. So I hope you enjoy today's X-Cast. Don't forget that we post each and every Thursday at 6 a.m. West Coast, Best Coast time on YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games, podcast services around the globe, and of course, roosterteeth.com. Don't forget, Kind of Funny is now Epic Games Partners, which means if you were buying games off the Epic Games Store, if you're upgrading your look in Fall Guys, Rocket League, and or Fortnite, please use our Epic Creator Code, Kind of Funny, at checkout to help support the team in a brand new way. And of course, talking about support, we always like to thank those who support us over on patreon thank you so much for supporting if you're at one of those tiers and of course most importantly thank you to our patreon producer delaney twining for being the Patreon producer of the month of May. This week, the Kind of Funny X-Cast is sponsored by BetterHelp, but I'll tell you about that in just a little bit. Let's jump in to this awesome interview with Rod Ferguson. I'll see you in a second. Welcome back, everyone. Of course, I am joined by one special dude for a big special day. It is one of the prime evils of the Diablo team. <laughs> they call him the general manager. I call him the big boss. It's Rod Ferguson from Blizzard Entertainment. Rod, how are you today? I'm doing great, sir. How are you? I'm wonderful, of course. I'm sure there's a big smile on your face and the whole team because, of course, today I have you on. It is the review day for Diablo 4. We are just mere hours away from the full release, but we get to check out all the reviews from all the critics around the globe, and it's very positive, Rod. I'm sure you're seeing it. <laughs> How are you feeling? Let's start off with that. Oh, just feeling great. I mean, the team has worked so hard uh, for so long in this game, and uh, they put their hearts into it. You know, we all love Diablo, and so uh, we're trying to make the best game we can for all the, the fans and the players out there. So to see that recognized in the critical reviews has been uh, amazing. So, yeah, I know we're, uh, we're you know, walking tall right now. We're about uh, 30 minutes away from preload and then 48 hours away from early, early access. So can't wait for people to join us in Sanctuary. Come on, it's so exciting to be able to jump back in because we've all gotten the taste thanks to your open betas before and of course the server slam. And we're gonna right. talk about that, but let's talk about these glowing reviews for just a second because you've been, you're an industry vet, you've seen a lot of reviews in your day, but you and your team deserve a lot of praise because right now I'm gonna read from our good friend Shinobi602 on Twitter. We got Diablo 4 reviews in. We got tens from Gaming Trends, Video Gamer, uh, 9.5s from Tech Raptor, nines all across the board from Press Start, Screen Rant, Twin Fin, and IGN. Windows Central Gaming gave it a five out of five. VGC gave it a five out of five. Here at Kind of Funny, we gave it a four out of five from our lead reviewer, Greg Miller, sitting at a Metacritic of 88 and Open Critic 89, but a 90 right now as it's updated. Rod, yep. what does that mean to you and the team hearing those numbers? Oh, yeah, no, it means the world. You know, like I said, we've just been uh, heads down trying to make the best game possible. And we've been doing it with the players, you know, since we announced in 2019, we've been doing quarterly blogs. And part of that whole server slam and our open beta is really to get player feedback. And so we're really grateful to our players who have helped us and, you know, gave us all that feedback and allowed us to make the game that we wanted to make. And it, the fact that it's been received well by the critics is amazing. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, though, as you, you talk about being a veteran and going through this, it's sort of funny to see how reviews have changed over time in the last 20 plus years, you know, and it's one of those things It's funny that you guys are that way, because I was always like, I'm a little, I'm always a little annoyed by the five star, five out of five ratings, because either you're an eight or you're a 10. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And so people always go like, oh, an eight, you know, it's like, well, they, they didn't want to give a 10. And so I don't know, I wish everybody would just standardize on a 10 point scale. And that way you can get a nine once in a while. But the, uh, you know, but I'm just thrilled the fact that we're uh, you know, a nine right now, an open critic is phenomenal, and I couldn't ask for more. I, I love that, and you know what? I'm hearing it, and I hope Big Boss Greg Miller hears that out there, because I love <laughs> I love that review scale you got going out there, Rod. But, yeah, it's kind of funny. We are four out of five right now. It's a great game from our lead reviewer, Greg Miller, but I love that. And, of course, 
congratulations to you and the team. I know this is a very special moment for yourself and, of course, a big team behind you, which is what I want to talk about first. I mean, as sure. a Diablo kid growing up with Diablo 1, but most importantly, Diablo 2, me and my brother loved this game. And, of course, Diablo 3 was special, but it has been quite some time, almost 11 years, since mm -hmm. the big mainframe Diablo. And I know that was really important to you and the team to kind of bring Diablo back to the spotlight and make something that's going to go on for a long time the reviews say that but of course internally how's the team feeling about seeing all of this and all the hard work paying off that's what i want to talk about for a minute yeah 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 i mean we we talk about the launch of diablo 4 is not the end it's the beginning you know it's one of the things about switching to the sort of this live service model is that we recognize that with diablo 3 being you know 11 years ago that um, we should have done more to to provide content and features for our players over those 11 years. And so we, what we wanted to do is set up Diablo 4 to be able to do that. And that's the reason for the live service is that we're going to be supporting Diablo 4 for years to come. And, you know, in very rich seasons, much richer than we have in Diablo 3, although the Diablo 3 seasons are great and millions of players still come back every season, which is awesome. But, uh, you know, we have the sort of a deeper, richer season structure, and then we're going to be doing expansions as well. So to us, this is sort of just the beginning and so that's kind of uh we're excited by that uh, i like that a lot and of course i was doing my digging on you rod i was watching some other interviews and there was the fun joke that you would have canceled Fortnite back in the day yes. was one of the one of my favorite lines i saw from you of course we talk about games as a service right this leave, living breathing world and it's not different from diablo 3 you put a lot of content into that but what is different here when we talk about the battle pass we talk about you know updates from the seasons or dlc what do you and the team look at when you talk about this living and breathing onward yeah, I mean, our number one thing is you can't pay for power in Diablo 4. You know, all of our sort of microtransactions, if you will, part of our battle pass and our shop are all cosmetic based. Um, so you're not going to be able to pay for power. You're just going to, you know, lean into how you want to customize yourself and personalize yourself. That's one of the big features of Diablo 4 is that idea of player choice. We wanted you to have player choice in how you look. And player choice in your skills and how you build, make your build, player choice, whether you play solo, co-op, or with strangers, um, you know, it's just, and whether you want to play the story in order or out of order, whether you want to explore the world or not, like, these are all things that were a big part of Diablo 4 for us, and so um, we wanted to have that, too, in terms of, like, embracing that power fantasy and what you want to look like, and that's what sort of the battle pass and the shop, you know, you're going to get lots and lots and lots of looks and transmogs, as we call them, you know, when you play the game that all look really cool but sometimes you want to have a specific look you want to be that just looks badass to be you know a necromancer that looks like that and so that'll be available to you and so that's kind of how we think about it I like that a lot and of course you talk about looks right there in the storefront I also want to talk about the future I know it's easy for us to get these games or the moment they come out we talk about more 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 but yeah. you talk about games as a service and of course the Fortnite quote before what's different now for you and your mindset when we talk about games as a service is there something that you've seen in the market where you're like oh we like that or is there something where you've seen others fail and you go oh we can do better than that when we talk about the content coming yeah it's it really a lot of it has to do with how you you make your team you know the, the size of your team and the way you structure your team and the way you structure the work um one of the things you realize, you know, going back from 20 years ago, um, you would ship a game and you go on vacation. There's nothing you could do to change the game once it was out. And so you basically would take a break. And now um, your players are so consumptive. They just want, what? give me more, give me more, give me more. And the fact that we can respond right away, you saw that in Server Slam. We, we've fixed, uh, we, we, we nerfed the, you know, the necroskeletons and we rebuffed them in within a couple of hours when we realized we had sort of over overtuned them. And that's available to us now as part of the service. Is like if we hear feedback, we can go in and, and adjust it on the fly. But really it's about, you know, when you're making a game like this, you have to make it in a sustainable way. You can't, you know, push the team such that when you get to launch day you cross this finish line and everybody falls over exhausted because guess what you know you have a season coming you have the week two patch coming because there's some balance changes or what have you so you have to build your team and your structure around a way that you can do that sustainably that because you're kind of always shipping in a way and in fact that's something we talk about is we have to 
build things in parallel. You know, right now, as I sit here, you know, we're about to launch the main game. We're finishing up season one. We're working on season two. We're working on expansion one. We're kicking off expansion two. All that's happening right now. And so we haven't even launched the game yet. So like you have to have a team that can work in that parallel way so that because it takes longer to make a season than it is to play a season. So you can't just like wait till the season ends and start a new one. You have to already be mostly, you know, done by that time. And so that just takes a lot of, of rigor and resiliency on the team. And that's what's been great about this team is that they They've really embraced the sort of parallel structure and the ability to be able to do that in a sustainable way. That's some great stuff. And it's awesome to hear you guys thinking about the future, but most importantly, thinking about the team. And that's where I want to bring you in, of course, as one of the prime evils of Diablo, but really <laughs> the general manager of this team. How do you lead this team when you think about a live service game and making sure people aren't burnt out, making sure you have the content and you're hitting those dates that you put out, whether it be two months, three months, six months? How do you stay on top of this team, but also make sure everybody's staying creative and still restful? Yeah, it's just about, you know, managing your scope and managing the people that you have, like what, you know, in business terms, you'd call it capacity. But what it really means is like, how much work, how many people do you have? Like, how much work can they actually do in a, in a, in a sustainable way? And so it's that notion of like, if I'm going to treat the date as we're making our date, I'm not slipping our date. Well, then you, you, can, you can only play with a couple other things, how many people you have and uh, how many features you have. And so that's something, those are knobs and dials you play with, making sure you have enough people and making sure you're not overscoped so that you're trying to deliver that something that's too big that you can't polish or that you can't bug fix. And so that's sort of something I really believe in is trying to get uh, something so tight, you know, uh, I think Blizzard used to call it concentrating the cool. They just get it down so tight that you can polish it and you, bug, you can bug fix it so it's high quality as opposed to something big and mediocre or kind of out of control. And so that, that's what we've really been focused on is making sure we have the team to deliver all that the swim lanes of work I just talked about and then just making sure they have the ambition that is you know have innovation make a great game but don't get out over our skis where we can't polish it or we can't bug fix it all and we put something out that we don't have full control of and so we manage that scope so that we can make sure we make our date with the team we have. I like that. Of course, you're with a new team. You've been there for quite some time, but you're now with Blizzard. You've been around the industry before. What are some of the things that you've learned from your time at Blizzard when you look around at all these incredible IPs, a live service game in World of Warcraft, right, of now right. Overwatch as well, but you look at it and go, hey, these are the time frames that they normally hit. This is what we should hit. What are you and your team looking at for seasons and content? What kind of date frame? Is it similar to what we see in WoW or shorter? Well, I mean, we're playing with that. Right now, we're talking about quarterly seasons. And I think a lot of our season, you know, learning really comes from Diablo 3 in terms of, like I said, it's going to be similar, but again, it's going to be deeper and richer. We're going... This, each season in, in Diablo 4 will have a narrative construct. So there'll be a quest line that will sort of take you through the new features and the new mechanics. And everything we do will be themed around the season in terms of cosmetics and the battle pass and those sorts of things. So, you know, we really looked at, like, what's the right cadence for us and we felt like every three months was about the right cadence um, and we wanted to make sure people had enough time to get through the battle pass right now we have 90 tiers in the battle pass so we want to make sure it wasn't this like oh i gotta go and i gotta hit really hard because if i don't even play for one day i fall behind like we wanted to make sure that people had the time they needed because we know not everybody's going to play every single day or and some people will get through it quickly and, and take a break and come back at the next season you know there's different play styles and so it was really a lot about looking at what you know of course looking at what WoW does and looking at what Overwatch 2 does and uh, but a lot of it was really focused on you know looking at what Diablo 3 has done as, as a really great learning. Let's talk about that battle pass because of course that is a conversation always in the gaming landscape that can be very hot very cold how do you and your team address that and make sure you're giving the players what they want and rewarding them but also maybe making sure you have the right content for it for the next season and beyond what does the battle pass really look like for the future of Diablo? Yeah, I mean, we see it as it's a great source for engagement as well. Like it's not, it's, you know, it's a nominal, it's like $10 and you can go in and that gives you an option to unlock all the stuff that's, uh, there's like 27, I believe, free tiers and 63 um, premium tiers. 
um, that you unlock with the money. And the notion around is, again, it's very cosmetics driven. There's some stuff on the free tier that kind of gives you these little, what we call, um, it's not words, it's not boosts, it's something like boosts, but it's basically these, these little things that help you mine resources faster or those sorts of things, but everybody has access to them. It's they're in the free track. So it's not, a, it's, again, you only pay for sort of cosmetics and, and things that make you uh, your customization. But that notion of having that a little bit of engagement, that idea of you know leveling up and going through the tiers is kind of gives you that little bit of motivation and momentum behind it. And we're just gonna to continue to listen. I mean, this is something that we're doing with Diablo for the first time. And, you know, we're going into preseason right after launch. We've got a, a we're till mid July, mid late July, then season one will start. And like everything is going to be just a learning process. We're going to learn what works in the shop, what works in the battle pass, uh, what do players really care about, what they don't care about. Like, you know, we don't can't guess to know it all. And so this will be part of it. And we haven't, unfortunately, just to where we were with those features, we weren't able to put them into things like Server Slam or the previous open beta. So they, they really haven't been put in front of players yet to be tested fully so i imagine there'll be a few hiccups when when those things go live in july but uh, you know hopeful that you know people embrace it and, and we're going to just continue to learn i like that of course rod let's talk about the new generation of diablo fans because i know you've already sold the older generations i'm sure they're very excited <laughs> to finally jump back into some more diablo but how do you attract new players because we brought it up in the conversation on our review a lot of people wrote in and said hey i've never played a diablo or maybe i'm going to play solo and it's my first time is this the time to jump in as a new player and i thought heck yeah i think you and the team did a really good job but in your mind how do you attract new players and welcome them to such a intense video game that the vets are going to love with all the systems but welcome new people and get them on the training wheels and onward yeah it's kind of you know think about it from two sides one you can think about from what we're doing in the game and then the other side is kind of what we're doing with the marketing uh you know from a game perspective it was really about okay what do we need to do to make this comfortable for new players and so one of the things was we set the game 50 years in the future from diablo 3 so that there was no hard dependencies you didn't need to you don't need to play diablo 3 there's nothing you need to remember from diablo 3 but it was still close enough for the old school that we could make tiebacks to like Lorath, who was in Diablo 3, who's a central character in Diablo 4. But we wanted to make sure that everything you needed to know about the lore or the story were being told to you in the game. You didn't have to do homework or read a book or go play another game or watch a YouTube video. Um, they're out there <laughs> if you want it, but we didn't want to make that sort of, you know, we didn't want you to have homework. And another part of that so there was that aspect of it of the setting but then there was also the story itself we wanted to take the story up a few notches so they have the best story that we've ever told in a diablo game because we know for new players it's part of that story is what gives them context which gives their play meaning not everybody's coming to diablo as this big systems game that they're going to go play for a thousand hours just you know theory crafting some people want to go have a great immersive cinematic experience and we wanted to make sure that we were delivering on that as well and then when you look at things like the prologue and some of the choices we have, you know, the do you want more tutorials, yes or no? Do you want to start on, a, you know, vet, World Tier 1 adventure or do you want to be, are you a veteran? And then that first prologue was really handcrafted to onboard players um, up through to Kyovisha because initially, um, we didn't have that. And so you woke up in the cave and you you had this open world and you could kind of go anywhere, do anything. And people kind of got analysis paralysis about like, what do I do? Where do I go? I don't know how to play. And so we, we sort of rethought about that um, and kind of handcrafted the experience early on so that we know, we know for a fact that where you get your first level will be in Nevesk in the town and you will be safe you can look at the skill tree, you can take your time, no things attacking you in the background, you're not in the middle of the woods. Like, and so we just tried to make sure that that first few levels on that trip to Kyovishad is really, you know, helping you learn how to play the game. And so that was really focused. And then of course there's stuff like controller support on PC that makes it a little bit easier to play. And so there's a lot of things there that we did to try to get the new player, including control uh, console support. But from a marketing perspective, it's a recognition of, we said, you know, we've been around for 26 plus years. Our, our audience, our core audience is aging with us. Um, and so how do we get new players? How do we get younger players? And so part of that was console, but the marketing is like, you notice our trailers are not using just orchestral songs. Like we're using 
Billie Eilish and we're using Halsey and, and we have a TikTok account now. And, and it's, it's about how we want to talk to players. You know, it's like we want to reach an audience we haven't reached before. And the fact, like you're saying, people are going, I get it too on my Twitter, which is just like, this is my first Diablo. Is it, can I play? Or it was my first Diablo? I need advice. And so that tells me it's actually working and it's resonating with people, which is exciting. TikTok, uh, Diablo with a TikTok. I never would have thought I'd seen the day, Rod. I never would have thought, but you're so right. And I love that. I think it is a very welcoming approach. And I think the onboarding process is very well done. And it is different than other Diablo games. Of course, we're talking about an open world, a living, breathing online world as well, which is much different than the previous Diablo games, right? So right. what was the thought process of making this open world, which is beautiful, big, bold, wild to see, but also it being living and breathing and people going to be running in and out of your world. There's world bosses. Of course, people <laughs> have seen the beta, but like, what was that as the team decision to go? Yeah, open world always online let's do this yeah it felt like a good you know a natural sort of evolution or innovation around the space about not to be just con kind of constrained to these sort of beautiful looking hallways the way that you know diablo 3 has and you know we were very purposeful about what we're doing there that when you're in a story space, when you're going through, you know, some anything to do with the campaign, you're in a private space. So you won't have somebody stepping into your cinematics or ruining the experience of the story. Every time you go into a story space, it's private. Um, and then even when, like, same thing when you go into a dungeon. No one's going to jump into your dungeon or those sorts of things. So when you're looking for that solo experience, that solo experience, if you want it, is there for you. It's not going to get interrupted by a bunch of people um, sort of jumping in and ruining for you. But, you know, it, it allows for this sort of, community to be built because you have this happenstance where you're like oh i'm about to do this sort of local event and i have to save these people at the wagons and a couple somebody will run in from off screen and help you and they don't steal your loot the loot is per player so there's no competition there and it's just oh thanks for the help and then hey you want to party up or hey you know like there's that sort of aspect to it and that's why i like to say you have the choice to play solo you know, play with friends, whether couch co-op or online, or play, you know, with strangers in the world and make new friends possibly. And that makes it feel like a living world. And we and we definitely constrain the space so it, it, you're not, you know, there's no big lineups anywhere or, or that there's too saturated because the technology behind it is actually really interesting. People don't really recognize that as you run across the map, you're actually, as you change what we call zones uh, with, with, within a region, you're actually changing servers. And so you, this sort of the seamless server transition. And so what we do is we manage how many people can be in that particular zone with you. And it'll change like it's in, within your city like Kyobusha, that more people can be there because it's a social space. But when you're out in the wilderness, like it's a smaller number, same thing like with a world boss, the max is 12, the, the floor is eight, but you can go up to 12 if you have parties and what have you. And so we manage the sort of population counts to make sure it doesn't feel overcrowded or it goes from a living world to, you know, a mall on Saturday. Like you don't want that feeling. And so it's, uh, but it, it gives it a certain sort of life that we really like and it creates this opportunity for community that we really like. That's some really rad tech behind that. And that's awesome to know what's going on behind the scenes because it is exciting to me seeing the future and what's next for Diablo. And I also want to give you a shout out, Couch Co-op. You know, a word that is old school, but also kind of <laughs> going away, but not. And like, shout right. out to you and the team for still focusing on that. And thank you for bringing that. I do want to talk about the servers, right? Let's talk about this always online persistent world, right? Of right. you guys did the open beta, you did the server slam. How are we feeling heading into opening day? Are we confident with the team is everything going to catch fire you know <laughs> what does that look like with you and the team behind the scenes yeah we'd never you know uh there's always a lot of knocking on wood whenever we talk about <laughs> this, you know things like this because um you know we're we pretty much have done everything we can you know we've been doing stress testing and load testing and with with bots and and automation and that was one of the great things about being able to do the the early access beta and the open beta and then server slam was we were actually able to bring in real players because you can't there's nothing better than to test with real players and we learned so much on all three of those tests and in the first two had that kind of rocky friday that we sorted out and then had a smooth weekend and um server slam we were feeling really great because we kind of took all those learnings and applied it and we really didn't have that rocky friday um but you know and, and it's <laughs> i liken it to when, when, when I had my tech director explain it to me one time, and he used this analogy that I really liked, which was around that, think of the game, an online game as an amusement park. And so when you open the park, which we're gonna do here on, on Thursday at 4 p.m., when you turn on the switch and the park opens, 
like the millions of people are going to rush to the front gate and so immediately you can't just instantly put everybody in the park they have to go through the the gate right and so that's going to take some time and then as it's going in you're going to start filling up the park and the question is can the park hold this many people or not and and so those are the kinds of different aspects we have to think and are the rides efficient and are the rides working well and so all there's definitely those three different aspects for us as we think about the server so We've been testing the gates, we've been testing the rides, we've been testing the size of the park, um, both with live players and with automation. And we're feeling good, like we wouldn't we wouldn't turn on the switch if we didn't feel good. <laughs> but um, but you never know until everybody shows up, you know, until when there's millions of people all knocking at the gate, you know, it's it's uh, it's always a new experience. And it's kind of interesting because I, I said this to someone else, like when I was back at Xbox, we used to just sort of follow the sun. And so, every midnight it would start in the time zone like you know australia new zealand and then starting at every midnight the game would open up for everybody and you have this slow roll of and that's not what we're doing here <laughs> we're we're literally <laughs> turning on the switch at 4 p.m pacific on thursday and everybody around the world can all get in and the same thing when we go live on the on the main launch on june 5th 4 p.m everybody can get in at the same time so there's a lot of people rushing for the gates so you know again we feel good we've done pretty much everything we can do but never say never I'm, I'm, there may be some bumps but you saw how we reacted we'll, we'll fix it and get everybody in smoothly man that's got to be exciting behind the scenes for you and the team <laughs> i i get gassed up just thinking about turning on the switch how much it's, fun yeah, it's really like, you know, when you watch the, the launches of a rocket and stuff and like command centers, like it's like that. It's really funny because listening to the voices because about, you know, you have certain thresholds about how many people you can let in per second and like, let's go to the next threshold. And we got clearance and getting four different people have to say yes so they can all agree to turn the key kind of thing <laughs> to let in the next level of number of people. It's, 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 a, it's a cool dynamic. It's fun to watch. Uh, let's, of course, talk about the veterans and the new players that will soon to become veterans. But let's talk Endgame because you've mm. been praised, you and the team, for the Endgame that you've brought by the critics thus far. Of course, you know, the bigger, larger user base will have their feedback. But how do you feel about the Endgame? Because like you said, we always want more, more, more as mm. the player base, right? How do you guys feel about the confidence in your Endgame? Because it seems like there's a lot to it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there's, in terms of the feature. This is the first mainline Diablo game that's actually launching with an end game in the box, if you will. And so we're excited about that. That when you complete the campaign, you can. There's hundreds of hours of end game content there for you. Um, and it's something that that's kind of the place where we're really going to see a lot of growth um, over the sort of seasonal support and expansion support about how do we continue to improve the end game and add features and maybe if something's not working, swap features out and bring in things that are you know working versus not. And um, just we've gotten a lot of great response on our the Helltide system, which is basically uh, once you get to World Tier Three, which is the next level of difficulty after campaign, um, you know a part of the map will go what they call hell tide where like blood will rain from the skies and a bunch of monsters will get harder to kill but it drops a special currency where you can go and go to a specific chest and get a loot like oh i want boots so i'm gonna go look for the boot chest and open that and get you know and narrow down my search for a particular legendary i'm looking for or we have the tree of whispers which is part of the campaign but it unlocks essentially a bounty system in the world and we have pvp in, in the fields of hatred and um, just there's a lot of stuff there to go and do in the end game. And so we know that, you know, like I said, there's some people who see Diablo as a story based game and we see some people, especially the hardcore, see Diablo as a systems based game. And those systems are where people that like, want the campaign is over for them. That's when the game really starts. And we wanted to have something there waiting for them and, and knowing that through the seasonal support and expansion will continue to grow and enhance that, you know, that experience. Nice stuff right there. Let's talk about PvP really quick because that excites me. I remember back to my Diablo 2 days where the fun one was where you were in the town and you'd, <laughs> you'd mouse cursor over just a little bit to pretend like you're outside, then you'd run back inside because right. it was just stand at the gates and then someone was going to murder you. Your <laughs> PvP, a little bit different, a little bit different coming into this one. Tell me about that because it doesn't seem like, oh, it's just a murder fest. <laughs> what is it? Uh, it? Well, I mean, it is still kind of a murder fest, really. Um, it's, you know, we have these areas within the map. There's, you know, Sanctuary, our version of Sanctuary is pretty big with five different regions. But there are two places that we call two fields of hatred. And when you enter the field of hatred, you're basically opting in to PvP. Now, you don't have to go in there. If you don't want to play PvP, you never have to. Even on the season journey, we talked about, you know, if you have a, in previous seasons in Diablo 3, there'd be like complete these five things. In Diablo 4, 
you'd be like complete five of these seven because there might be two you don't want to do and one of them might be PVP. So you can always avoid it if you don't want to do it. Um, but you can go into a PVP area, basically opt into it, fight a bunch of other players as well as PVE content. There'll be monsters and stuff to get because you're, you're picking up this currency. And again, you, you kind of cleanse this currency on the way out so that you can get cool, badass PVP cosmetics. And so if you want people to know that you're a player killer, then you'll have, you know, you can get a really sick looking mount or mount trophy or the way your armor is and people know to fear you and not go in there when you're there but it's all optional and it's all opt-in but if people want and have that experience they can definitely go have it yeah it reminded me very similar of the division with the dark zone right where yeah we are going to collide but you're also you're killing the pve situation to grab stuff and come out of it so i like that blend of instead of me waiting for you to cross the line rod and attack you I, I like what you guys have done there so kudos to you on that yeah thanks yeah I, I, i've noticed that too the dark zone reference but the it just actually is really cool too is like if you're having a lot of success then people get sort of a thing goes over your head to say like you're you're carrying all this currency so now you become a target so people want to start hunting you down so there there's definitely a risk reward aspect to it uh, Rod, I don't have much time with you left, but I do have some quick rapid fire questions for sure. you and I to get into to have some fun with. Of course, I want to start off with, you know, in some of the people's reviews, you guys played it safe. You did exactly what people thought, and maybe you didn't break out of the norm. Was there something on the cutting room floor? Or was there some sort of risk in the development world that you thought, hey, let's do this, but you maybe pulled back on when you were looking back on it? Um, not really. I mean, the notion like that was, sorry, I know you want these to be rapid fire, but I have a Oh yeah, let's, we can do it. Let's talk. Yeah. Um, you know, when we looked at like the, the difference between a game that ships every year, like take a sports game, um, you know, if they're going every year, then your question is always what's new this year, what's new this year, what's new this year, right? And then when you're dealing with a game where the, the previous incarnation was 11 years ago, you have to walk a different line. You have to start talking about nostalgia and paying homage and respect to the past because, you know, after all, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. And so it's really about this was this balance of, okay, what are, you know, I always say it's the dark tone of one, the progress, you know, the progression of two, the combat of three, plus its own innovation of freedom of choice and, open, and shared open world. And knowing that balance of like, hey, we know people are going to come to this with all these expectations from the past. How do we, how do we meet those? Like we want people whose favorite Diablo game is Diablo 2 to love D4. We People whose favorite game is Diablo 3, we want them to love D4. So we really focused on how do we both pay respect to the past, but also find some new and cool innovations. And what's really nice about a live service is that even if we cut something, it's not necessarily cut, it's really more postponed. Mm -hmm. And you know, we saw that, and again, this isn't a new innovation because it's existed, but one clear example that are Rune Words. So Rune Words was, was a big feature in Diablo 2. And early in our development, we had talked about Rune Words as being a feature at launch for Diablo 4. But as we were developing that feature, we felt like we couldn't do it justice uh, in the time that we had. And so we decided to cut it, but by cutting it, we said, oh, this is something we can look at bringing as part of the service as maybe part of a season or part of an expansion. So it's one of those great things where you're not sort of just chopping it off and, and it's, you'll never see it again. Now we talk about postponing, like, okay, where, when, when could we do this? When would this be applicable? So, um, but yeah, so that's how we sort of think about it. I, I like that. Are there, can you tease us? Is there anything that maybe in the future you'd like to bring in i know you sometimes we hold that off but is there anything where you're like oh man i would love us to try this in the future no i mean i sort of the rune words is definitely one of them okay. like rune words is something that we think is really interesting and there's a lot of really interesting mechanics you can do with rune words and finding those you know using that as a something to go find that you can sort of piece in to get socket in to make a whole new thing like the, there's a lot of really cool things that rune words unlocks for us and that's why we felt it was a deeper system than we had time to really do on top of everything else that we did for Diablo 4. So that's something that we're looking into the future about how we can bring Rune Words back. Sweet, that's awesome. All right, we'll go back to the rapid fire questions. Okay, These are sorry. more rapid fires, I promise. All right, favorite class out of all the Diablo games? Oh, I think people know I'm a necro main necromancer, okay. and I went and I actually went and got a necromancer tattoo. So I'm, oh, I'm you're like badass. <laughs> once, 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 once you get you know inked for life, you kind of have to keep saying that's the class. You know, even if it's not, you have to go like, nope, necromancer for life. I like that. A class you'd like to see in the future one day. Oh, uh, oh! I could really piss off a lot of people right now, Mike. You oh. just set me up so bad. <laughs> oh so good. yeah, there we go. Because like, yeah, no, I can't do that. That would be mean. Um, 
Uh, you know, I, what I really like is like, I think we did a really great job with our five classes to, again, look to play styles and respecting the past. And so what I'm really looking forward to is just more new things. Like, I think a lot yeah. of people keep going back to like, oh, I want to see this thing you did from a previous game or this thing from a previous game. And I, I'm really looking at like, where can we take it different? Like, what, what could we do new in the Diablo space as opposed to only pulling from the past? I like that, and I look forward to seeing what you guys bring in new, right? I think you've done a great job bringing the staples, the foundations that we all know and love. And also, like you said, blending some of the classes that people have loved previously and turning them into something new. So, yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what you got there in the bag later on, for sure. Um, favorite enemy type in the game? Oh, Because, man, enemies. oh, man, I love playing this game and going... Oh, I remember those guys. They're some of my favorite. <laughs> oh man, these are awesome. Like, is there a favorite that you just love and behold something special? I, I have always like I always had a soft spot for the fallen and because of the shaman of the that whole yeah. resurrection mechanic, I've always because it really changes up the battlefield, that notion of, oh, I just can't sit here clearing ads because there's somebody in the back getting make bringing them back to life all the time and so that in first initial change in tactic where you're like oh i have to go hunt down you know the shaman before i go kill the rest of them and so i've always had a soft spot for that one because it, it was it's a real quick like learn about oh i have to think about my back combat and not just kill everything right in front of me how about the cows rod are you a cow guy <laughs> what's up with the cows let's talk about that i have no idea what you're talking about um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Joe Shelley, our game director, he's been very clear, like one of the things that we really want to do for Diablo 4 was we really wanted to ground it as much as possible. And so we've had some fun, but we wanted to make sure that it felt authentic to the kind of gothic, dark themes that we had. And that's why we don't, you know, the number one, or the number, you know, top two things from Diablo 3 that any person with any sort of business sense would have done would have been to bring wings and pets over because ah. those are by far and away in Diablo 3, wings and pets are the number, you know, the top of the, the, the stack. But we didn't want to have, you know, on launch day, 30 people in town walking around with demon wings or angel wings on their back. We didn't want a bunch of cats and dogs or whatever, little mini things running around everywhere. It felt like it would break the immersion. So, you know, we've been really focused on trying to keep it as grounded as possible. And because of that, there's there's no secret level in Diablo 4 that people might be looking for in the, like uh, as per previous games. But that doesn't mean it won't be in the future. I think there's that South Park documentary that talks about like what you can do in season one versus what you can do in season 21 are very different. And I think we'll see that will be true for us as well. I, I like that. And I like that you guys stayed true to form with the vision, right? Because I think it really hits home that blend of Diablo three meets Diablo two and that Gothic dark tone really hits home while you're playing this. And sure. I don't want a bunch of cows on their hind legs chasing me with a bunch of <laughs> halibreds, but like, it would be kind of cool, Rod. It would be cool. I have no idea what you're talking about, <laughs> but, but the, yeah, I mean, you can see it actually like in our ultimate edition, we have the wings of the founder, which is our, the only wings we really have, but, and, and so that people weren't walking around with angel wings, we made it an emote. So it's more of a flourish so you can sort of turn it on you'll flourish the wings out and then they'll go away and then you know so they're very temporary and i use them to great effect while waiting for a shava during server slam but you know it's just one of those things like that's the way that we're thinking about it that's cool uh my i have two left this is okay. one of the final diablo ones okay. what's your favorite boss in all the diablos you have some killer ones in this i don't want to spoil anything but like when you look back are there any incredible bosses that you really loved I really love, in, for Diablo 4, I really love the Butcher, the Butcher's Return. You know, the Butcher was a classic boss from Diablo 1 where you felt like you were being ambushed and scared. And, you know, in Diablo 3, you know, it's great, but it was more of a, here's the arena, you're going to fight the boss here, and here's the Butcher, and it was kind of known. And so the fact that we brought the Butcher back as this random encounter that any cellar, any dungeon, you never know when the Butcher will show up and, and try to take you out, just adds this layer of excitement that you never know when it's coming. And so kind of hearkening back to that feeling of, of Diablo 1 but and having that excitement that moment of surprise I think is great so I really love the butcher in D4 I love that he just chases you through all the halls right <laughs> like you never feel safe with the butcher <laughs> around because he's yeah. just gonna find you and so uh, that's a great answer of especially course especially with hardcore if you're playing oh. hardcore and you get and you don't want to die and like every dungeon or cellar he could be in there like I, I just love that that stress <laughs> and kudos to you guys for the fun hardcore uh promotion going on of course if you beat the game if you're one of the first to beat the game in hardcore mode you will be uh forever in sanctuary can you tell me a little bit about that before we go what, what's up with that 
that? Sure, yeah. It was just sort of an interesting idea that the marketing team came up with, actually, is that we wanted to have a little statue um, here on campus. And because, you know, we have the big orc and it's very famous orc and, and everything, but we wanted to have a little statue. And so the idea became, well, why don't we, you know, for the first thousand players who can beat or get to level 100, which is our level cap uh, in hardcore, which means you can't die. If you die, that character's dead. You have to start over. Um, and if they do it, we'll put their name uh, or their battle tag or what have you on, like, on the statue. Um, and so I'm really curious because, like, we don't actually, like, I don't know how long that's going to take. <laughs> like, we have, we're kind of having discussions around that because they wanted, you know, marketing really wanted something quick. They were like, oh, we want to do something that is, it will be done in a couple of weeks. And, and I'm like, well, I think I actually want it to be sort of more prestigious and, and play it out longer. So I'll be curious to see because Hardcore 100, I, th I think people are taking it for granted and, and maybe I'm wrong and, and we, we fill up all a thousand in two weeks, but I think this might be a longer burn. And so I'll be, I'll be curious, but that's exciting. Man, to be immortalized on the Blizzard <laughs> campus with a little statue, that sounds pretty dope. Oh, I might have to try that now. <laughs> I'm really excited. Well, right. you you played the review, so you can't. People played the review build. They're not oh, eligible. dang it, Greg. You <laughs> held me back from greatness. Uh, well, I look forward to my friends and all, all the awesome Diablo players to get on that. My final question for you, of course, this is an Xbox podcast. We are the kind of funny x cats and you have some great history with Xbox, and I wish I had way more time to talk <laughs> That's Xbox with you, but right. I will ask you one final thing. What are your favorite Xbox IPs and franchises when you look at the then and the now moving forward? Are there some that you love and some that you're looking forward to? Uh, is it cheating to talk about Gears of War? I think no, you can is. talk about it every day of the week <laughs> with me. You know that. Uh, I mean, yeah, of course. Like, I, I've 50, you know, I've been making games for 25 years and or 24 years, and 15 of them were on Gears of War. So, uh, obviously, Gears is near and dear to my heart. I'm hoping. I don't know. I have no insider information. I am but a outsider. <laughs> but man, it would be cool to see something about Gear Six or something, you know, at the at the showcase coming up. I'd love that. Um, I'm a big, you know, Forza Horizon fan. I play a ton of that. Um, I go back to the Fable days. I'm hoping there's some Fable action at the showcase as well. Um, but I mean, it's just there's, you know, when I was there, this is when we started to grow Xbox Studios, Xbox Game Studios, and there's so many great people and studios there that they make just, just super creative and super smart. Um, and you know, there's a lot of things sort of cooking there. I imagine, given the number of studios that are there, and any of those are just awesome, you know. And so, uh, you know, I, I like the main lines, uh, you know, IPs that you would expect. Um, but I'm sure there's going to be some stuff that we're going to be surprised by, by, you know, game, you know, studios like Compulsion and In Exile and Obsidian. Like they, they always pull out these sort of great, fun games to play. Oh, exciting stuff. You got to always highlight it. Shout out to Gears Hive Busters. What a great experience, Rod. I don't know. I'm sure you played it, but it uh -huh. was an awesome Gears experience that should always be screamed from the rooftop because it's <laughs> just that good, and I want people to play it because I love it so much. So, Rod, that's how we'll end it. I am blown away that I got to spend some time with you. I know the X-Cast audience and family will really appreciate your time and getting us all excited for Diablo. Once again, congratulations to you and all the team over there on your hard work and the success. We're very excited to slam those servers the moment you <laughs> flip them on and have a ton of fun in Sanctuary. So on behalf of myself and the Kind of Funny team, thank you for joining me on this interview. All right. Thanks for having me. Appreciate of it. Of course. And with that, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Peace. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. It's so easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. I know this from experience, how often it just seems easier to care about others and to keep it moving. But when we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burnt out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. Some of my very best friends use BetterHelp and love how helpful it can be for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash kindoffunny today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash kindoffunny.
Welcome back, everyone. Of course, now I am joined by two very special people to me. Of course, it's one of my gaming dads, Mr. Paris Lilly. Paris, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing fantastic, sir. How are you doing? I'm wonderful, Paris. You know, you and I, we've had some very special guests throughout these past couple of weeks from Phil Spencer to my guy, Jeff Grubb. And I had a special one-on-one -on -one with Ryan McCaffrey last week. I know, sadly, you had to miss that. Thank you. Uh, that was great, by the way. Yes, really, <laughs> really good. Yeah, I'm sad I missed it. Very special. So I'm getting a lot of my gaming icons and heroes on the show. And of course, that leads me to the next special guest, someone that I look up to and really enjoy and try to follow in her footsteps. It's the busiest lady in the biz from What's Good Games. Of course, Andrea Renee. Big Red, Andrea, how are you today? What's good, Mike? Good to see you, Paris. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. I know we've been talking about this for a really long time and finally got some scheduling that synced up. So thanks for having me on. Yeah, really special to have you, Andrea. So thank you for your time. And I know me and Paris are both pumped and excited to see you. I think Paris is a little more excited than I am because he has something, <laughs> some beef with you on the grill right now. It's true. <laughs> yes, it's 100% true. So I, I was a guest on, on What's Good Games. God, how long ago was that? Was it a couple months ago, three months ago? It was long. January. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beginning <laughs> of the year. And a conversation came up about the Elder Scrolls Six. Mm -hmm. And when we thought it would release, and I said, there is no way you will see that game in this current generation. It will not debut on the Xbox Series X. And you disagreed. I did, but I think you're not being fully truthful about <laughs> exactly what happened in that conversation. And good thing there's a video record of it all at youtube.com slash what's good games if you want to go chase that down. Uh, so we did have a conversation about that. And I thought that that was a really wild thing to guess. And then we made a bet yes. where you said you didn't think the Elder Scrolls Six was going to be released until 2030. Yes, and I stand by that. And I said, that's absolutely insane. <laughs> It's okay. I'm telling you, it's not insane. We're in 2023 right now. We're, we're, we're going to literally talk through this on the show. We're in 2023 right now. Starfield's going to come out now. We already know that that team is going to be the same team that is going to make the Elder Scrolls Six. Can we agree on that? It's not the same team. There will be some overlap, yes, but they have multiple people on that team. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Here, here it is. Yes. Yes. You got the video. <laughs> But my, my point on that is this is going to take a very long time to make. It, it's not coming anytime soon. There, there's no way. I, you, you would want to think Fable, I think all the things that Xbox has coming, not to mention this team's going to stop production on Starfield and then ramp up to make the Elder Scrolls Six, which is going to be such an ambitious open world RPG. I would not hold my breath until 2030. But why are you bringing this up now? What's the real reason? Because you're on the show and I, and I get to say it's over. <laughs> that's what no, I, nothing to have to do with Starfield and that's imminent release. Nothing like that, Andrea, just because you're here. Well, okay, I mean, okay. Well, you just want to reiterate to people that we made a bet and you think I'm wrong. And yes. I think people are on my side. Did I see Todd Howard at the Dice Awards in February? Did I, did I mention to him that we had a friendly bet about this? Did he laugh out loud when I told him the bet? <laughs> he sure did. And he that's all I'm going to say about he, that. <laughs> he laughed because he's like, how did Paris know this? That, that's why he laughed. <laughs> oh, Paris, I love your commitment. I mean, I think we all are hoping that you're wrong, though. Right? I, I hope I'm wrong. wrong. Let's be crystal clear. I hope I'm wrong. I, I would love to get the Elder Scrolls Six way before that. And... Again, I'm so happy that you're here on the show, but I mean, the reason I, I legitimately am thinking that it's just we've seen all the production issues, development issues that games, not just Xbox, but across the industry have been having over the past few years. And I just think if you want to make sure that you get it right, you need to give them as much time as humanly possible. So, I mean, the earliest being realistic, 2027, maybe 2028 up in there somewhere, but I want Elder Scrolls 6 to be the best that it possibly can be. So we'll, we'll obviously get a sneak peek here in September with Starfield. So fingers crossed. Andrea, are you looking forward to Elder Scrolls 6 though? Absolutely. I <sighs> loved Skyrim. I think that Bethesda Game Studios take, taking advantage of all of the modern technology that has been innovated since 
you know, the Elder Scrolls five released, it's going to be exciting. I think there was plenty of memes about the incredibly <laughs> painful, long loading screens in Skyrim. Right. Yes. So I think them taking advantage of the new hardware is going to be really interesting. Them seeing how they've evolved the formula, but really I mean, Skyrim is also like the bar in a lot of areas of open world RPG and storytelling and exploration. I know a lot of people want to attribute that kind of storytelling to a very new game like Elden Ring, but I'm like, oh no, there was other people doing it first. And Elden Ring obviously put their own spin on it in a very unique and cool way. Um, but I'm excited for, for Elder Scrolls to come back, absolutely. Good, good. I'm glad to hear that you both are excited. Of course, maybe further away than we think if you're Team Paris over there. But, of course, we got to talk about the future of games coming to Xbox. And it's pretty fun because summer is now here, Andrew Renee. We've been outside barbecuing for Memorial Day weekend. We're back. PlayStation just had a showcase. Xbox and Summer Games Fest is right around the corner. And that's what I want to talk about right now. Because, of course, last week, as of recording this, PlayStation did have their PlayStation showcase. And Xbox sent out a fun little snarky tweet afterwards to remind <laughs> Xbox players that a number of those games that were shown during their showcase will be coming to the platform. Of course, that's where I want to first talk about it is, hey, what were some of the games that caught your eye? And then we'll talk about the Xbox showcase. But to kick it off, Paris, I'll go over to you. Of course, Xbox put out the tweets with their marketing team and their social team. And you see Immortals of Avium is coming, Ghost Runner 2, Marathon from Bungie, of course, Metal Gear Solid Delta, Snake Eater. You have Dragon's Dogma 2, Alan Wake 2, The Plucky Squire, and many more titles. What were a couple that stuck out to you that you're excited to come to Xbox as well? I mean, Plucky Squire. I mean, right off the top, that, that's that's the number one that, that comes off of that list for me because I think that just looks so innovative and I can't wait to try it. And, you know, it's coming from Devolver Digital, so they always do great stuff. But um, Talos Principle 2 is another one. I love the first one. Um, I, I think not a lot. Of, it gets a lot of awareness. Obviously, it's an older game, but hopefully people will get to check this out now and pick it up because I, I think that's a fantastic franchise as well. And then, obviously, Alan Wake 2. I mean, how could you not be excited about that? And we're, we know we're getting it this year in October. So definitely a, a solid third-party lineup that we got to see in, in that PlayStation Showcase. A lot of great titles. Yeah, a lot of great titles. Andrea, there's a couple that he missed that I know I think are up your alley. Maybe Assassin's Creed Mirage. Let me know what did you like coming to Xbox from that showcase? You called it, Mike. Oh. AC is <laughs> one of my favorite franchises of all time. I've been very pumped to see what the team is at Ubisoft is doing with Mirage. We've obviously talked about it before. And when I mean we, I mean the gaming media community because Ubisoft did a giant Assassin's Creed showcase about a year ago, kind of detailing the future of the franchise. But this is the first real lengthy look at Mirage that we've gotten. And I expect we're gonna get an even better, deeper look at the Ubisoft Forward event that is happening after Summer Games Fest, which is what, almost, a little less than two weeks away now, about 10 days away to the Ubisoft Forward event. So very pumped for this. I played almost all of Valhalla on my Xbox Series X, and I am very, very pumped to play Mirage. And also, come on, Cat Quest. Who doesn't like a little Pirates of the Caribbean, right? So adorable. That is a good poll, and I think a lot of people were excited about that, Andrew, I will say. A lot of people liked that one as well. Uh, really quick, I want to park the bus really quick on Assassin's Creed Mirage. For those that aren't in the know, Andrew, what is the big selling point of Mirage? Because it's a little bit different than what we're used to right now with the past three games from Odyssey, Origins, and Valhalla. This is going to be a smaller title, right? Well, I mean, yes, it will be. It's not going to have the same sprawling map. And we don't really know exactly the size of it, right? Uh, Ubisoft hasn't given us a lot of those details yet. Again, I expect we're going to get a really good look at the Ubisoft Forward event. So what I think is really interesting about this from my perspective as someone who's a longtime fan, fan of the franchise is that the star is Bass, and we met him in Valhalla. So this is set ahead of the events of Valhalla where we kind of get to see Bassam in his, you know, assassin glory days before he becomes like more of a more of a mentor, right? And um, it's set in Baghdad. So it's set in uh, more of like the birthplace of the Brotherhood and kind of where the creed comes from and a more traditional sense of Assassin's Creed with the 
emphasis on assassinations, right? We see a lot of the hidden blade in this new trailer that we got during the PlayStation showcase. And I love that. And I know a lot of fans have really wanted a return to form to make it feel like it was, you know, more rooted in the origins of where the franchise came from. And I think that we're going to get a lot more emphasis on stealth gameplay. But they also talked about how you're going to have you know, your choice. Do you want to go in stealthy? Do you want to go in in disguise? Do you want to just, you know, go in like uh, blades blazing? Is that what we say instead of guns blazing? I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm pumped for it. It's going to be, I think it's going to be excellent. I like that, Andrea. And, you know, of course, I would be a fool if I didn't call upon our director and producer, Bear Courtney, who's the king of all things Assassin's Creed. I already know. Bear. Yeah. While we were watching, I was like, <laughs> man, you know, the selling point of this gets me excited. But watching that during that PlayStation showcase, and small, sure, it was a small snippet of it, but it didn't get me as excited as I once was for Assassin's Creed. This one didn't move me like Origins and Valhalla did when we saw those pieces. Bear, what am I missing here? Get, get me excited like Andrew and they just did. I, I don't know if there really is anything else. Like, I, I think the big selling point is, uh, yeah, bringing it uh, a little bit more focused back to where the series has started, which is what I'm excited for. It, it seems like a more kind of a modern take on uh, kind of the, the visual style of AC1, which is really exciting. Um, and, yeah, I, I don't know how else to, to excite you. Uh, Mikey, maybe if it was a hundred uh, assassins dropping into an island where you have to take each other out, maybe that's what gets you in. But I don't know if that's going to be. I don't you know, know, know me so game. well, man. Assassins Battle Royale. You're, you're, yeah. Well, which the, you know which they had a good multiplayer. Out. They had a really they had a good multiplayer. multiplayer in, like, yeah, the AC two and Brotherhood days where you'd like uh, disguise yourselves as normal NPCs and try to act like an NPC while also killing other people. That was really fun. So shout out to that. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if if it hasn't brought you in yet. I I don't know if this will be the the one for you uh, when it comes out later this year, Mikey. Yeah, I think I'm waiting for the next one, right? That dream of feudal Japan, the samurai warrior. That's the one that I've been holding out hope for. But, of course, we have Ghost of Tsushima over on PlayStation, and I know that's essentially what I've always wanted. So I should probably just play that and stop waiting for the You Assassin's haven't played that yet, Mike? Uh, I've dipped about seven hours in, Andrew. So I know that's how good nothing. it is. But, uh, that's Andrea, like I, be, you're walking around I, petting like two or three foxes. That's all you've accomplished. There were so many foxes, Andrew. So much wind to chase. There <laughs> There was flowers going left. I went left. It was a good time. Paris, what do you think about Assassin's Creed? I mean, it, it's funny with Assassin's Creed. Like, I, I want to say this feels like it's getting back to a return to form of Assassin's Creed. But at the same time, I thought when they started going more open world RPG with it, I was enjoying it. But ironically enough, like you talked about Valhalla, I didn't enjoy that experience. So I think for me, seeing them going back to more of what made Assassin's Creed great at the start focusing more on assassinations and everything what mirage is going to do i'm, I'm for it going back to the, the parkouring just just everything that made assassin's creed great so i'm definitely looking forward to it and and obviously we know with ubisoft and just a lot of the lack of AAA titles they've had over the past few years being able to get this one to come out should be pretty big for them so i'm looking forward to it yeah, I'm a, they're on my good side right now because I was really pleased with Far Cry 6. I thought Far Cry 6 was their best since Far Cry 3. So <laughs> Ubisoft has me where I'm like, okay, I believe you right now, but also you put out Roller Champions and Riders Republic and you lost me for a little bit. So they, they kind of got me on the big AAA side. So, so, so hold, hold on one second. So Mike Howard, you know I Tell love me. you. And, and I, I watch a lot of kind of funny content. Mm -hmm. And I heard you say that on another Loved I don't know it. It was it KFGD or yep. whatever. And when you said that, I was like, what really? It it, it didn't grab me. It just didn't oh, wow. it, it was was not for me. I actually enjoyed five more for me. And I know that wasn't necessarily, you know, one for everybody. But yeah, six, it it just it just didn't get me. So it was surprising to hear you say, yep. but hey, yeah, Loved you, know, it. you enjoyed it, you enjoyed it. Yeah, I love six, and so I was really pleased with that. So they're on my good side right now. Let's see with what they got. Of course, that Ubisoft forward coming very soon. Mm -hmm. But for me, of course, guys, we got to talk about it. Metal Gear Solid, right? I mean, that's the big one that I'm really excited about. And to know, it's not exclusive, right? There was some murmurs. There was some worries that this could be exclusive over to PlayStation. But it is exciting to know that the development team, Andrea, do we know who's actually on this yet? Because they just put the development team in their tweet. I think they finally came out with the name for 
who's ever developing this remake over here. But uh, I'm excited for Metal Gear Solid Delta, aka 3, Snake Eater, because as Barrett knows, our show director, we've played through all the Metal Gears together, 1 through 4, and it was a very special moment. 3 was the one that I found the most boring as someone who was riding shotgun with Barrett. So I'm excited to finally go hands on the sticks and to see this franchise hopefully get a nice special remake, just like all these other awesome titles we're seeing from, of course, Resident Evil and beyond. So if that's what it's going to be, that kind of level of quality, I'm really excited for Metal Gear. I can't wait. I am never going to pretend like Metal Gear is what blows my skirt up, just like straight up. Um, I do think it's interesting to watch how the development of this is going to play out, knowing that you know the creators aren't involved anymore. Konami has confirmed that people who are working on it are devs who have worked on the series in the past, but they haven't been really forthcoming about names of people who the leads are. I imagine we're going to get a bigger media rollout of that as we get a little bit closer to launch and after they do like a proper preview event. But I mean, Paris, are you also like Mike, are you like all in the Metal Gear camp? I'm 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 the resident Metal Gear hater here. Um, the, the quote, the quote <laughs> I like to use. I'm not the only one. Yes. I can't deal with the boxes, man. The hiding in the cardboard boxes is too much for me. I, I was just waiting for Barrett to jump in. That's what I thought he was going to do earlier. No, my my thing being being serious for a second. I mean, I played the first one. The the second one made me mad, and then I just never played it again. So I've actually never played Snake Eater. So for this to come out now with this remake, I'll give it a shot. I'll, I'll give it a chance and and see you know what what all the fuss is about because some people consider it as one of the greatest games ever made and definitely the best Metal Gear ever made. So I'll give it a shot and check it out. But um, yeah, when they pulled the Okie Doke on me in Metal Gear Solid Two, I, I was so mad. I was like, I will never play this franchise again. <laughs> <laughs> This one's going to be really special. And of course, I'll bring in Baird because Baird, you and I, we played three. You were on the sticks. And of course, we saw the age of some of these games dating back to Metal Gear Solid 1. What are you looking for on the playing side of things to really be elevated on that, Baird? I, I really don't know just because uh, the most modern Metal Gear I've played was, was four. Uh, so that's like, uh, you know... I, I haven't touched five, so I, I imagine maybe they try to integrate some of the what I hear of like the crazy stealth mechanics from five into three. Uh, again, this being an internal Konami team, I don't know how dedicated they are going to be of like really bumping up the gameplay to to make it something completely different than the original game. Maybe just uh, slight adjustments to to camera work and and all that stuff to make it a little bit more modern feeling than uh, the original that we played. I think. On like a backwards compatible for for Xbox or whatever, um, but I'm just uh, excited to see it in in more of a, an HD space because that's I would say that's like one of the more cinematic games out of out of all of them. Of just it, it really reminded me a lot of uh, of specific movies when we played through it. So I'm just excited to see it in like a a more HD uh, beautiful landscape. Um, and I'm excited for you to play it because yeah, uh, on the kind of technical side and uh, the systems throughout that game, it, it felt like the pinnacle of what that series had to offer. So again, you're wrong. It's the best one in the series, Mike. And I, I can't wait for you to admit that you're wrong uh, whenever this game comes out. I hope I eat my words because I have said it's the worst one of the series because I was watching. Everybody will get mad over there. But uh, yeah, I'm excited for this one. And then, of course, going down the list, right? I think there's some great polls. Dragon's Dogma, I think a lot of people are excited for this sequel. It is a well-known franchise. A lot of my friends love it. I've always been a Kingdoms of Amalur and Dragon Age kid, so I'm excited to try Dragon's Dogma 2. But I know there's a lot of energy and excitement around that. Ghost Runner 2 looks hype as can be. I'm very excited to jump into that sequel. Got a little taste of Ghost Runner 1, and I think that is a ton of fun, and I'm looking forward to this next one. And then I have a question mark that I'd love to see what you guys think. Immortals of Avium, of course, I got invited by EA to get a little uh, preview before the release. I know a couple people actually have gone and played it, but I was before that, so I got a preview of this. People, ex-Call of Duty devs, making a first-person shooter battle mage fantasy game. The shooting and movement looked fun, but I was not sold on the story and or voice acting. I thought it wasn't up to snuff of what I wanted out of it, and I worry we might get a little forespoken uh, type vibe coming out of that. But it did look good gameplay-wise. What do you guys think coming out of EA Originals here with Immortals? Like, may I ask a production question really quick? 
This is out on the 31st? July. It's out in July. No, no, no. I mean, this episode, I'm sorry, is out yeah, th tomorrow? This is out, uh, this is out tomorrow, and we are currently uh, live for our Patreon kids. Uh, oh, okay. Well, then I will keep my comments to myself. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Paris is going to share something with us, but we'll do it next week then. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. I, 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 will, I will just simply say that um, this looks interesting, but I will save my full detailed comments for a later date. Okay. I like that. Andrew, Renee, have you any thoughts on Immortals? Listen, I love first-person shooter games. I love magic games. I love fantasy. Mm. This Venn diagram overlap of who this game is for, Andrea <laughs> yes. Renee is right in there, right? But I am nervous. I'm nervous that we haven't gotten a lengthy gameplay demonstration and the game is coming out so soon. I am hoping that, you know, previews that are going to be coming out, I believe, in the next week or so leading into Summer Game Fest are are good um i would love for this to be fun it looks really cool but it's interesting that you brought up forespoken kind of as a parallel it's like forespoken mm. also looked really cool and i think that that game was doing a lot of cool things but clearly mm, some of the things they weren't doing as well and i'm worried that immortals is going to fall in that same camp of wow these ideas super cool the execution not quite there but we don't know yet so that's just kind of my the vibe I'm getting based off the coverage I've seen so far. But fingers crossed that it's going to be cool because I really want it to be dope. Yeah, I like that, Andrea. Is right. Very well said. Uh, well, you two, those are some of the games coming to Xbox, of course. Shout out to the Xbox social team for a fun tweet after that PlayStation showcase. But that's where I want to segue this conversation to, of course, the Xbox game showcase and our Starfield deep dive are right around the corner and PlayStation kind of left the door open for maybe Xbox to have the summer showcase of 2023. And I want to know what you guys' vibes were coming out of PlayStation. Did it hit for you? Did it not deliver like many thoughts? And of course, can Xbox now deliver and possibly have the showcase of the summer? Andrew, I'll start with you. Does Xbox have the juice? Can they do this? And what did you think of PlayStation? Xbox absolutely has the juice to have the showcase of the summer. We've seen them put out bangers of showcases before, and I think that they've been kind of holding their cards to their chest a little bit when it comes to first party reveals this generation, right? Xbox Series X and S, I don't need to reiterate to you guys or to the people watching this show that we're still waiting, right? For like the bangers from Xbox, we're still waiting. So, and they have a bunch of stuff in development. They've done a bunch of mergers and acquisitions over the last five years. And we also have, you know, that looming Activision Blizzard deal um, in, in the background kind of, is it done yet? Is it not? It's almost done, I think. Um, so I think that they're poised to come out with a really incredible showcase. I think PlayStation in the past has had like game industry defining best in show press conferences. I mean, I think when you compare PlayStation and Xbox, to me, PlayStation has almost always won the hype moments of their E3 showcases or their showcases around, you know, E3 or Gamescom moments. And I think they just fell a little flat this year as Paris is probably gonna talk about as well. I saw Paris's tweets about it. Um, and that's okay because you can't have a banger year every year, right? The, the, you're going to set an impossible bar for yourself to try to, you know, one up yourself every single year. I think I was a great showcase. We saw a wide variety of games from a bunch of different studios. But as everyone was saying online, I'm going to reiterate, they were lacking in their first party. And that's where I really wanted to see more. That Spider Man 2 reveal, the very end of the showcase, super cool. Probably a little bit too long, right? That was like a lot of Spider-Man. Probably could have tightened that up a little bit and maybe given us a little teaser of something else from one of their other studios. But overall, I think Xbox is poised to come in and sweep the leg. You know what I mean? Oh, sweep the leg. Paris, Karate Kid reference there. Are they going to sweep the leg and actually land this? I hope so. I hope so just for the the sake of what i think this showcase means to xbox this year you know obviously going back to the phil spencer interview where we kind of just ran down a lot of the games that they've announced since 2020 and we've just not gotten any kind of real updates 
or, or gameplay looks at, at these games. This feels like the year that that should be happening for a lot of those games. So I hope that does happen. And then obviously the Starfield Direct that comes right after that. You know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to to watching it because I, I do think Starfield is going to show great. I think I will walk out of that with a smile on my face going, man, I can't wait until September when I play Starfield. But when I related to the PlayStation showcase and funny, Andrew brought up the tweets, I've actually... I've actually been more of a defender of it than than a naysayer in in this sense. And like I, I watched, you know, the what what kind of funny did Greg and everybody did, you know, as far as the showcase goes and their their thoughts afterwards. I didn't a hundred percent agree with that because I felt sure they needed more first party titles, a hundred percent. But it was a thing of the because we just ran them down the games that they showed. I saw a lot of games that I wanted to play. So it wasn't terrible. Like people were painting like it was terrible, but I don't think it was great either. I just thought it was okay. Like a six out of 10, something like that. Right. A six uh, out of 10 though. That's, that's not great. That's but, almost but, failing. That is, that is pretty much failing. It, it, it's in the middle. It's what I'm trying to, it's what I'm trying it's to say. Middle, it's, Andrew. it's in yeah. the middle. He yeah. says. <laughs> cause, cause I mean, look, Spider-Man two, I like, you thought it ran a little long. I loved it personally. I mean, I, I can't wait to play it whenever they, uh, you know, James Stevenson, you're going to give us a, a release date, but yeah, they needed more first party things. And like I even tweeted today, it was, it was funny that they announced Ratchet and Clank coming to the PC. And I'm thinking, well, hell you could have put that in showcase instead of Gran Turismo, right? Just things like that, that I, I saw with that showcase that seemed a little off to me, but you know, obviously the last of us factions seems like it's in some development trouble. So that's clearly why it wasn't there. Maybe they should have gotten out in front of that and said it before the showcase. That way it could have set an expectation for it versus I kept waiting. I'm looking at the clock. I go, when when are we going to see factions? And then we never got it. Right. So they could have done a better job with the PlayStation showcase. Maybe rumors they're going to show more later this year, I guess we'll see. But in relation to Xbox, this is a grand opportunity for them right now. If they can come strong with their first party lineup at this showcase and those games show well, they can put some release dates or some release windows around some of those games. It's going to get people excited. It's going to get people looking forward to what Xbox has coming here in the short term. And I would assume, you know, in, in, in the far future as well. So we'll see. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it, you two. Uh, Tim Gettys asked me at the end, he said, do you think Xbox could deliver? And I said, yeah, they can deliver, but will they? I was very apprehensive on the will they, because we just seen in the past couple, especially last summer, I think we all really look to and think to, in these past two years of first party com- or first party titles, they just really haven't landed the plane and delivered on that expectation for the gamers. And that's where I'm really worried here, right? Because we're going to go Xbox Games Showcase in into that Bethesda deep dive with Starfield. And the worst thing that can happen is we go to Starfield and I forget the games that they had during Xbox, right? If it's a lackluster to find showcase and I just, we come out of that and I go, uh, don't really remember what they showed. That's a bad thing, right? I need to be like, oh man, I can't wait to talk about it right after this Starfield thing where I remember the five or six titles that meant something. Because if I come out of that and it's like, uh, I feel like that's a big miss. It's funny you say that because even if you go back to last year with with the showcase they had, obviously it was a 12 month thing, but I even said it then. I go, I want to remember two things out of the showcase, Kojima, Starfield. So there's, to your point, that that potentially could be happening again. The fact that they're saying it's separate from the showcase, but really it's not because it's just tied to it. So it's like this big two hour show. And then the last, what, 30 minutes of it is going to be Starfield or however long and long it's going to be. So there is that thing of maybe Starfield shows so well that that's all we're talking about versus the other things, but no, I'm hopeful. Uh, no, I don't it, think so. I, no, and I, yeah, yeah. And I was, I was, I was going to caveat that. I was yeah. going to say, I don't think so either because Look, for all intents and purposes, we should be seeing Hellblade 2 at, at the showcase as an example of a game that I feel will show very well. We know Force is going to be there because that's so close to launch. Hopefully we get things like Avowed, you know, and other things like that, that and some surprises that hopefully there is a big buzz that comes out of it. But Starfield will dominate the conversation no matter what, just because of how of how big this showing is going to be, you know, here coming up in June. So, again, we'll, we'll see. I, look. I'm excited for it. I do think as much as we've talked about Xbox here over the last few weeks and months, and you know, they've had, had obviously we've had some bad news and some bad showings over the past few weeks. I think the showcase can erase all of that. 
as long as they come strong with their first party lineup. And I do think they will. Andrew, any thoughts on all that? Because, yeah, like I said, my worry is we roll into Starfield, forget everything. And I know you kind of perked up there. What are your thoughts on the pacing and what they need to deliver there? I think that, I mean, clearly Starfield is going to dominate that news beat as it should, right? It's their banner, you know, triple-A tentpole game that they're going to be rolling out. It's highly anticipated from Bethesda Game Studios. I mean, I mean, we've been talking about it now for years at this point, but I think that they are poised to do a really great showcase if they maybe stop focusing purely on releases that are coming like they did last year in the next 12 months. I think that really limited and sprinkle in a little bit of those get hype moments because Gamers want that from a showcase. They don't need to get updates on games that they can play a month from now. They want to see the teaser trailer for the game that they can play four or five years from now. Because I think we are a culture of wanting to have that excitement, wanting to figure out like what are the rumors about what's going to happen with what games. And I appreciate the transparency when they talk about a game like Fable and when they revealed that trailer and afterwards we're like, Hey, wasn't that a cool, fun trailer to confirm we're working on Fable? But hey, just so you know, it's a long ways away. Don't hold your breath for a release date. I still think it's important to give updates on like, how's that going? You know, where are you guys at in the process of Fable? You know, like, what does that look like? But for the Xbox marketing team, that also means that they have to balance that with other projects and go, well, we have, you know, multiple fantasy titles on our slate right now. Like how much, you know, real estate in our marketing beat do we want to give to titles that are four or five years away you know and i think finding that balance of like the really like get hype viral moment that people are going to be talking about on social media and shows like this and also giving real updates to the business that provide consumer confidence and where xbox is going as a brand and also shareholder confidence where microsoft gaming is going as a company is a really difficult job and i don't envy the people that have to put that showcase together yeah, I completely agree with you on that. And that and that's just kind of been my my thought on this as well is finding that balance. I mean, sh- this is why I was bringing up all the stuff that they talked about in 2020. Sure, it's great to announce it. But then now we're in 2023. And I feel like I still don't know anything about a lot of these games like Everwild is the biggest one to me that sticks out. It's like, I don't even know what that game is supposed to be other than you've shown it once i think twice maybe but you've not given any real update on what's going on and obviously there's rumor and speculation on why that may have happened but i think that's the biggest thing right now with xbox is you have all these studios you have all these things that we are clearly aware are in production right now but we haven't had any updates on it but like you're saying and marketing and trying to balance it out and when do you say it when don't you say it that's kind of the key like personally like you brought up fable I, I don't think we're going to hear anything from, about Fable in this showcase personally because I, I don't think, think that's so either. Out. But I really yeah. want to. I really want right. to hear something about Fable. But at the same time, there's enough near-term things that I absolutely need to hear updates on uh, coming out of the showcase that I'd be fine not hearing about Fable if we do get updates on those. And I think for me, anyways, like we talk release dates. Uh, that's why I also brought up release windows. Even if they had a guy, let's just say avowed. Even if avowed, they can't say, oh, it's coming out March 25th, 2024. At least just say, hey, coming in 2024. So now I know, man, at some point in 2024, I'm getting avowed. You know, at least that gives me an update now. So I don't have to wonder, man, how far are they in production? Is it still years away? Is it close? I don't know because you're, you're not telling me. So hopefully, you know, we get a combination of those type of announcements uh, in the showcase, you know, in June. So you talk about how difficult it is to build this showcase with the lineup that they have and the expectations to deliver. Of course, we will do our predictions episode next week for the big showcase. But I want to, what are some bunnies, some gimmies, Andrew, Renee, that you, me, and Paris can rattle off a couple? What are some must-haves or you think will be there that will get the hype moments going? Uh, I'll start off. The Xbox Game Pass family plan, I think, is an easy gimme and an easy win to announce here and release in the States or the wide world. Of course, we do know it's in a couple of countries. They've been testing it for quite some time. So maybe it is time to a small win to offer up family pass for a, a number of people to use that. But what are some other gimmies or wins, Paris and Andrea, that you got? I think a a good gimme could be an update and a hard release date for Lies of P. 
So that was a big win for them. Last year was one of the games that had a ton of buzz coming out of the showcase. And I think if they show us some like a nice gameplay trailer where we get to see some things that we didn't see in the last one and then hit us with that release date because allegedly it's coming in 2023. It was supposed to be coming, you know, late summer. And we haven't really heard an update on the release date for it yet. I think that would be a great time to to do that in the showcase. That's a great pull, Andrea. And I actually watched Andy Cortez play a lot of this game over at GDC. Uh, so I am looking forward to this one, Andrea. I like that pull. That's a good gimme. Paris, what do you got for me? What's a gimme? What's a bunny layup here for this one? Yeah, one for me. And, and shout out to Ryan McCaffrey when you had the interview with him because he brought it up. I was like, man, he must be really listening to my tweets. Replace for me that I think it feels like it should be coming out this year. I think that would be a great one for them to show off put a hard release day on it day one on game pass the whole thing um yeah that, that'd be that'd be another one for me that should be an easy layup i like this one paris i know you're very excited about this and we've been waiting for it uh it will be very excited to see this on the console uh for me i got another fun one for you andrea i don't know if it will happen so don't hold me to it but i think a <laughs> stealth release a day and date of Forza Motorsport would be a big win for the Xbox Ooh. community. It was dated. Yeah. It was slated for spring 2023. So, of course, we have moved a little bit of that goalpost. But, I mean, I think it will come out in the fall. But I think a big win for gamers would be Phil comes out. He's got the car, whatever you want to show off, and say, hey, it's here now. Go play it. I think that's a big win, especially needed in the first party lineup of, like, hey, give these people something to play and give us an easy win. I think it's Forza Motorsport today right away. I love your enthusiasm for that idea, knowing that they're going to be managing the wave of the Diablo 4 launch, oh. like just the week prior. I do not think that they would do that. They do not <laughs> want to share marketing real estate with Diablo 4. That no, game is I going agree. to crush it. The game looks absolutely incredible. We're seeing, you know, early review scores already um, really doing well. And, I mean, from my time with the game, it's fun. I wouldn't want, if I was Forza, I would be like, <laughs> nah, Phil, we're going to, like, we're going to wait at least until, like, July or August, thanks. And and not to mention the other monster that's coming right behind it in Final Fantasy 16. Oh, I would yes, stay the exactly. heck away from the month of June. <laughs> so many good games, everybody. There's too many good games. Uh, let's go around one more time. Andrew, do you have another gimme that would get hype uh and get people excited yes if bioware came out with a look at dragon age dreadwolf that would be amazing mm -hmm. i don't think we're gonna get it because the rumors i've been hearing is that bioware is behind schedule on it obviously we've been expecting this game for quite some time now but if the rumors maybe aren't as true as i think they are what a banger of a moment for xbox if they could come out with a really incredible trailer because we haven't really seen anything from dragon age for you like we we've seen you know like these kind of background trailers and getting drip feed information from bioware but we haven't gotten like a proper tra even like a cg trailer I, I would i prefer something in engine at this point i would like to see that but i'll take a really cool cinematic trailer that actually has characters in it like that's what i want that's what we all want I like that. Yeah, the last time I think I remember that there was like a flame on a wall and they were giving us text on the screen. Is right. I was so, so frustrated. I want more. I was like, what right. is this? What? Why are you even bothering? <laughs> Paris, give me one more. Of course, we'll talk predictions next week on the episode, but give me one more get hype moment that you'd like to see. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to stay in Eastern Europe and I'm going to say Stalker 2. Okay. That would be, again, this year. You have a date on it. That fantastic video they hadn't extended last year to be able to follow up on that this year to say, now the game's coming out. Here's the date, day one on Game Pass. I think that'd be a great look for them. Some great wins. And of course, only a little bit of time. We'll finally see what Xbox has up their sleeve. Great opportunity to really steal a lot of the mind share uh, after the PlayStation Showcase. But we have a lot of video games to talk about from Jeff Keighley's Summer Game Fest. Of course, Xbox and Bethesda and Ubisoft all coming your way during this summer. And I know a lot of people, probably when they heard us talk about the PlayStation Showcase, are going, hey, what about Bungie and Marathon? You have the two biggest Destiny Guardians here, Mike. Why did you not bring up Marathon? Well, of course, I'm going to save it for right now because... We got two pieces of Bungie topics that we need to talk about with you two. First off, Marathon coming to Xbox after the acquisition from Sony and Bungie. So that's a big deal for Xbox gamers. 
Are you excited for that game? And then let's talk Destiny 2 with the final Shape Guardian. So first off, Andrew, what's up with Marathon? Are you excited about Marathon? And then Paris, I'm we'll excited for anything Bungie makes. Like Bungie <laughs> has instilled over a decade, multiple decades at this point of goodwill uh, with for me as a gamer from the things that they've worked on. So I give them a hall pass to literally get me to buy anything that they put out and I will try it. Um, I never played the original marathon. I thought it was so interesting, you know, with you obviously just had Ryan McCaffrey on the show. He was tweeting about this after the PlayStation showcase about, you know, is this a full reboot? And we, you know, got a few more details from Bungie on it. But um, I think this whole like cyberpunk era that they're clearly leaning into with the reboot could be really exciting. Obviously, people are going to look at it and go, is this just going to feel like Destiny? And I would say... That's not a bad thing. Destiny feels pretty good. <laughs> yes, uh, Andrew, it's an extraction shooter from everything I can gather. And I have seen you once snipe someone out of a helicopter while we were playing Warzone. <laughs> so I know that did you happen, got game yeah. in that. It was nasty. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm very excited. I mean, like you said, Bungie, in my mind, they got the hall pass to get me excited for anything. Of course, you got to prove it in the pudding once you go hands on the controller. But to see this, see what the kind of world they're building. I'm interested and I'm really pumped up about it. But Paris, extraction shooter. Now we kind of get into PvP, of course, Destiny. You have Destiny's PvP, but you also have a lot of the PvE. Where do you fall on this? Are you excited for Marathon? Yeah, I'm definitely excited for it because the irony is if anybody's been playing Destiny 2 over the last few years, is there really a PvP anymore? You, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, but uh, the I fact mean, of it is... Just get engrams, you know, yeah, those yeah. pinnacle drops, and that's about it. <laughs> exactly. But, but the whole point of that is a lot of that team moved over to Marathon. So, yeah, I'm excited for it because to Andrew's point, anything Bungie-related, I always get excited about it. I've not been big into the extraction shooter genre. I mean, I know there's Escape from Tarkov, things like that. But I want to start getting into it, and this is this is an easy layup excuse to want to go jump into it with you know with Marathon. I didn't play the first one either. I've obviously heard over the years about it, and it's so funny because having having a few friends over there at Bungie, and they were working on the new game, and obviously never telling me what they were working on to see Marathon. When I saw, I was like, finally, you you get to actually talk about what you're working on, which is great. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm absolutely looking forward to it. Bungie has that pedigree of being one of the best studios in the world as far as making shooters go. So I would expect nothing less when it comes to Marathon. So going to really be interested to see what their take is going to be on this. And I can also publicly say that Bungie reached out to me late last week and invited me up to get a look at Marathon over the summer. So really looking forward to that. And obviously, if and or when I'm allowed to talk about it. You know, maybe I can do that on the show. That part, I don't know yet, because you know there's going to be a thousand NDAs surrounding it, so we'll see. I like that. Very exciting stuff. Looking forward to seeing what they can do. And uh, Extraction Shooter, we'll see if I get into it. But let's talk about something you two are very much into. Destiny 2, the final shape. Of course, we saw a familiar face that everybody gets excited seeing whenever he's on screen. Andrew, I see you smiling, so I know it hit home. Oh, this oh. was the highlight of the whole showcase for me. <laughs> I'm a Cade stan for sure. I was very excited. I mean, they should, they just should never have gotten rid of him in the first place. I mean, but the final shape as an expansion is something a lot of Destiny players have been looking forward to for literally years at this point. There was a big contingency of the Destiny community that felt a little let down by Lightfall and mm -hmm. narratively where they went. I mean, there was a lot of great stuff baked into that expansion, but I think people were hoping for, you know, what's supposedly coming in the final shape to happen at Lightfall, but um, I think that this is going to be a really nice combination of where Bungie has been setting up the events of the lore of the last several years of the game and where they go from there, who knows? But I mean, fingers crossed, Final Shape is going to be epic. I like, I like hearing that and I like seeing your enthusiasm. That means it's going to be pretty good and exciting to see. Paris, I was reading up on it. Destiny, the Bungie team wrote transformative moment for Destiny here. Of course, I thought it was pretty great. The gameplay they added in Lightfall just recently. They're looking at adding more gameplay uh, elements to this. Are you excited for The Last Shape? And what can we expect out of your mind? Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited for it. Uh, to, to Andrew's point, they never should have got rid of Cade 6. But 
I will say from just a story standpoint, Forspoken was probably the best story campaign that they've ever done because of that, because of you getting rid of this. Forsaken, you mean? Did I say Forspoken? You oh, did, yeah. 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 It's, <laughs> mind, we it's okay, I do it all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but yeah, you, you got it right. Um, but to the point, yeah, that was such a huge story moment to to kill off Kate the way that they did. And then how that story ends, and I won't ruin it for anyone that, that hasn't done it, was great. But to now see Kate Six come back, to see Nathan Fillion actually come back to voice Kate as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see it. It will be interesting just with everything that's had gone on the last few years with the Destiny story and with the darkness coming in, the witness and all of that how the final shape is going to wrap up this story for destiny that that's going to be the big thing about it. and they even dated i guess what is it august 22nd they're going to have the big reveal of it so really looking forward to that as well i i will just say just andrew i'm sure you can co-sign this i've been on the destiny train since the alpha going back to 2014 yep, same. And to, yeah and to see they said 10 year plan and they're literally going to hit it, which is just amazing in today's video game world that they were able to keep me engaged with this game for a decade. I'm still as engaged today as I was back then, which is just freaking wild. I mean, we've seen obviously all these different iterations of it from story standpoint, PVP, just everything that's happened. But through all of it, I'm, I'm still here. And, and I'm still excited to see what the final shape is going to be and how they're going to wrap this saga up. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all in, Mike. All they finally it. put their MMO hat on. They, yeah, they, they did. resisted <laughs> it for a number of years. Yep. And then I think, you know, once Luke kind of took over some of the creative reins, he was like, let's just lean in. Like, this is yep. what we are trying to be. It's what our hardcore players want. Like, let's just become the... MMO, RPG, FPS, sci-fi game that we've always dreamed of being. And I think that they finally are, are getting to their stride. And it's really exciting to be a Destiny player now. There's just so many things to play, though. <laughs> well, I have a theory. I have a theory on that. And since you're here, Andrea, I, I would love to get, get your opinion on this. It's so funny because I've always thought here just over the last couple of years, this isn't really this is really Destiny 3. I've, I've thought in my head the fact that, like you said, they're leaning more into the MMO aspects of it, but they've not gotten away from that. I almost thought at one point they would just strip the two and just start calling it Destiny again. I have a theory that we're wrapping up this Destiny 2 saga with the final shape. And then we are going to eventually get a true Destiny 3 that is just a full on MMO RPG. I think that's the next iteration. Yes, I 100% agree with you. I mean, Bungie has said almost as much about how, you know, we sh probably shouldn't hold our breath for a game called Destiny 3, that right. this is the way that it's going to be. And we're seeing other games kind of follow suit, the idea of creating a more persistent universe for yep. live content to live in so that they can just keep updating the game world with expansions instead of having to recreate a whole new set of worlds and characters and narrative outside of that. And, you know, I don't know like how long it's gonna take for us to get there, but I love that they're bringing some of the story stuff full circle and that the game is more fun to play than it ever has been. And it's, it's great. Yeah, completely agree. I'll, I'll just say this one last thing on it. I wouldn't want to whatever the next thing would be right away. I would want them to take a break from Destiny for a few years. Obviously, Marathon's coming into the picture, kind of lean on that for a while. I'll, br I'll bring up 2030 again, but closer to that than try and do something like right after you end Destiny 2, give it a few years. Maybe that is PlayStation 6, whatever the next Xbox is. It would kind of come out around that time. But I would like a few year break away from Destiny just so that I can miss it. So then when whatever the next iteration is, I can be excited for it all over again. I like but seeing you too long, smile. Paris. That's too long. You're not <laughs> missing long. it at that well, point. You're well, forgetting. You're well, forgetting course, how to play. Well, you don't know how to, how to do your fancy <laughs> warlock jumps. Like, you know, like that's too many years. I mean, a, a, a break, sure. That's fine. Well, Breaks are well, fine. And, well, Andrea, according to you, we're about to get the Elder Scrolls 6 next year. So, you know, we'll, we'll have something to do in the meantime. <laughs> hey, that's not what I said. <laughs> All right, you two, we got some more fun stuff. Of course, Paris, I'm going to kick this segment over to you because you have some fancy new earbuds that you want to fill us in from, I believe, Razer? 
Yes. So yes. obviously, if anyone's watching on video, I normally have head cans on, and now I, I have earbuds because Razer sent over. I don't know how much is going to show on the camera, but this is their Razer Hammerhead Pro Hyperspeed earbuds, completely wireless. They do Bluetooth. There's also a USB dongle that that is provided as well that provides low latency. These are THX certified. Um, they also do active noise canceling. Um, like I said, you can connect this over Bluetooth, so you can connect this to your, to your phone, any type of mobile device, like I'm talking to you right now over my PC. Um, these particular ones work on the console, on the PlayStation 5, more specifically with the USB dongle. They do not work with the Xbox. Um, I, I've noticed the other Razer brands, they have ones that are specific for the Xbox. So these work on PlayStation, they work on PC, they work on mobile devices, they work on the Switch as well. And they're great. The sound production is really, really good. Actually, talking to you guys, I had to turn the volume down because that's just how good it was working. And right now I do have the active noise canceling going on. They have the RGB chroma on, on here as well. Um, Love you a can, rainbow light. You've got to yeah. have those, Andrew. Yeah. That's so cool. So... Well, I'm turning it off just so you know, but save <laughs> because it saves battery. The, the battery's been pretty good, but these will, you know, drain the battery even more. So I'm going to turn them off, but I can't yet because since I got them early, Razer has not updated the app on the iPhone yet. I was actually talking to Razer. They'll do it later tonight, and then you'll be able to control everything from the app, which, which is great. But even just using this as a daily driver on the PC, you know, as I'm working, obviously here I am doing the show. They're completely fine. They can switch simultaneously right right over to via Bluetooth over to your mobile device. So I can use it on my iPhone, switch, et cetera. So they're good. And like I said, the sound production is really good. THX certified. I like them. I really do. So I appreciate Razer for sending them over. And when I get the app and everything set up, I'll probably talk about it a little more next week as well. But uh, so far, so good. I like hearing all of this. Andrea, are you a Cans or a Buds gal? What What are you rocking lately? You know, so I'm currently wearing wired buds. So depending on what I'm doing, I'll either wear buds or cans. I like over the ears in certain situations. It's hard for me to find good earbuds because I have pediatric sized ear canals. Um, I go to an audiologist for my tinnitus and I've mentioned to them like I have trouble with earbuds. And they were like, yeah, it's because your your ear canals are like, are incredibly small um and i was like oh well so this makes sense why I, like any kind of earbud that has that little round like exchangeable nub at the end you know they they, they just pop right out of my oh, ears wow. so but and i get nervous paris about using a bluetooth connected wireless earbud when i'm recording and when i'm doing production so I would love to hear once you get more time with them, how the battery life is, how the connectivity mm -hmm. is, because that's my fear, right? That we'd yeah. be recording a show like we're recording right now and then something happens to the buds, they die or whatever. And now I'm like scrambling to find a replacement headset yeah. and plug it in and do all that while we're live. And so I've been I've been nervous to try it. So would love to hear your extended impressions. So I will say because I forgot to mention it. So like I'm talking to you now on the PC, I'm not doing it on Bluetooth, even though I could. I'm using the USB dongle here on on the PC, and that's the whole part of is from from a gaming standpoint. It, there's lower latency, so you're you're getting better audio production. You're not having any any kind of you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Audio interference. Th thank you on on that as well. Um, but to your point, yeah, that is, that would be a concern of mine as well, as far as just the battery life. Like even before this, I made sure they were fully charged <laughs> before we came on because I didn't want to have any type of issues. But, you know, as I you know play around with them over the next few weeks or so, we'll, we'll test it out and see. But like I said, so far, so good. And from a range standpoint, when I compare it to like my uh, my Apple AirPods, um, close, not as good range standpoint. Like I said, I leave my phone in here and walk and go upstairs. Works pretty well i i definitely kind of hit hit a limit with them but for the normal person there really shouldn't be any issue at, at all from a range standpoint andrea you're a pro great question there you're just a pro you've been there you know what's going on i'm a buds boy andrea i only want buds now that's my new thing i don't want over the years anymore uh and i'm looking for that one that will connect to all my devices right i'm i'm now living in a house with roommates and i'm very self-conscious of my noise factor right so i just want to have buds that will go from the tv to the xbox over to the playstation the computer i don't want to disrupt anyone in the house so i'm 
on the search for a good pair of buds. But my biggest fear, Andrea, similar to you with the earbuds falling out, is I like the over-the-ear wrap of the earbuds, so I know they're securely in there. My question to Paris would be, if you're working out or if you're walking, maybe running up and down the stairs. Doing some downward dog? Do they fall out? Thank you. Am I doing some yoga? Are they in? What's happening? Okay, so, you know, I had to do the gym test. (laughs) They're they're fine. They're just as good as my okay. AirPods because that's not what I normally use. Yeah, no issues at all. Didn't fall out. They're they're pretty secure. I like hearing that. I like hearing. Do that. they well, have bleed? Do they have audio bleed? Oh, because that's a big thing too when you're using them for recording. Is like if you're using earbuds, you can get a a lot of bleed, meaning the microphone you're using picks up the sound coming from your earbuds. Does the noise canceling make that go away? Yeah, I think I think so because that's how I've been using them. I haven't noticed that at all. Mm, I like it. Great questions, Andrea. Well, thank you, Paris, for telling us <laughs> all about those earbuds. Uh, of course, people will learn more about them as we tell them more throughout the coming weeks. And your full thoughts on that. But thank you, Paris, for that. No, absolutely. Guys, only have a little bit of time with you two left. And, of course, I want to know what the heck you've been playing and how your life's been. Andrea, like I said, you are a big inspiration of mine. You are one of my gaming heroes. And I love getting to spend time with you because it is a big deal to me. And, of course, I have a couple of questions for you heading into the summer. But I'll start with the fun, easy ones. Hey, how are you doing? And what games have you been playing? Mike, you are a true treasure. I enjoy spending time with you. I miss that you came into the Kind of Funny family after I moved to Los Angeles. It it makes me sad all the time that we don't get to hang out in the office together. But Mm -hmm. um, I am obsessed right now with Diablo 4. Uh, They gave us pre-build access. I was part of the group of media who was selected to um, take a look at Diablo 4 ahead of review. Um, And then they turned the build off and wiped our characters. (laughs) <laughs> so sad that I'd have to do the beginning of Diablo 4 for I think like the fifth time um, based off how many media previews I've done for this game but I can't stop thinking about how I just want to be playing Diablo 4 um, I picked up you know, Tears of the Kingdom again last night after I did my daily check in at Scrooge's shop in Dreamlight Valley. And I was playing around um, in Zelda, just being like, this, I wish this was Diablo. <laughs> so I'm very excited to, to play more about that. But it's a busy couple of weeks for us here in the video games media industry coming up with Summer Games Fest, the Xbox Showcase, and then the Ubisoft Forward event. It definitely feels like that E3 vibe that I. I'm going to be missing this year because there's no E3, but I'm excited to be here in Los Angeles and to be going to some of these events live in person, which is going to be really fun. I love going to press conferences every year, so um, I'm just really pumped for that. I think it's going to be a really exciting way to kick off the summer. I like that, Andrew. What what character are you going to main in Diablo? Let's start with that. Uh, so I was talking about this with Rod Ferguson, the GM of Diablo, who obviously was just on before we started talking um, on this episode of the X-Cast. And he, I think, maybe convinced me to roll with a necromancer, though I really want to go rogue. And my original pick was sorcerer. I was like, I love magic. I'm always like a fire mage when I play in RPGs. But the rogue was just so much fun to play. Like the bows and arrows and the daggers feel so good. But now it seems like there's a buff to the necromancers because that's Rod's favorite character. And I was like, mm, do I go necromancer? <laughs> I don't know. You go with what the big boss says is right, because he <laughs> knows best for sure. Paris, what have you been playing lately? So before I tell you what I've been playing, I, I will just go along with the, what you're talking about with Diablo. So I, too, got the, the early access and I knew it was going to get wiped. And, you know, I, did, I was traveling and doing stuff last week. So I, I, I didn't play it at all. I was like, you're not wiping my progress. <laughs> you're like, you're I'll, not I'll wait. me once, Blizzard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, I'll just wait. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump into it here now. And it's been great to see all the review scores and, you know, see, the, see what Greg and every not. Was it Greg? That wasn't Greg. Yeah, review. Greg, it was Joey Greg. Yeah, it was Greg. Greg yeah, was Joey. Yeah, right. Joey, because we played. I, Britt and I got to play with Joey. We had a little girls' trip down the coast of Sanctuary. Yeah. It was great. Oh, I watched the Street Fighter and Diablo reviews back to back, so I got confused. I was Tim and Khalif on the Street Fighter <laughs> review. But anyways, point is, um, yeah, it looks great. I, I, I'm self-admitted. I've not really been a Diablo person, so this is kind of my entry into it. You know, I played the beta and you know enjoyed it, so I'm I'm excited to jump into it. What I've been playing is that Tears of the Kingdom. Oh, man. 
it, it's a, it's, I, I, look, I've seen the scores and everybody say, I'm sorry, it's a wrap. It, there's no way that's not winning game of the year. That's the game of the year. Woo, the game of the year. That's it, correct. It, yes. The innovation that Nintendo has been able to do, like I, I, I can do whatever I want. I can build I can do anything. Honestly, I don't even feel like I'm following a certain path. I just go, well, let's see what happens if I go in this direction. That's how I play. And then I just build these contraptions and I see what people do online and I go, man, I'm not talented enough or smart enough to do that kind of stuff and wish I could. But that's what makes it so great. And like, I think I even saw Tim tweet that he got because I don't have the Master Sword yet. So I'm excited for this moment. I've seen people saying this is like an epic moment, you know, in, in gaming when you get this Master Sword. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. But this is definitely one of the best video games that i've ever played so just kudos to, to nintendo and what they've been able to create and like even if you're looking behind me on the video you might see i even got a zelda uh case <laughs> for my switch <laughs> that's how much i've been enjoying this but yeah tears of the kingdom is phenomenal definitely 10 out of 10 you know keely it's gonna sweep the keelys it's it's gonna be great love it I I like hearing both of those from both of you guys and gals. I, I have played a lot of Diablo, and I was very sad to see my character go, Andrea, and I'm ready to roll the dice again for the fifth time is right. And I've played a lot of Tears of the Kingdom. I am so happy Diablo is finally here because I've been looking for something fun to play with my friends. So I'm actually going to bring a different game up. Last week, Wait, I wait, wait. Before you bring that up, I need to know, me. who are you rolling as? What's your character? I'm going to go with the Sorcerer because I okay, love okay. the magic. Yes. I, I had a moment where I tried Barbarian, and I was like, you know what? Throwing out cool fire and lightning spells, way cooler. I got to go back to where it's fun. Uh, but I talked about playing Alana uh, over the past couple of weeks and how great that game is over on Game Pass. It is highly recommended. I gave it a four out of five. Great on our podcast. But for me, I want to tell everybody about a fun PC game. I know we're on an Xbox podcast, but this game really stole my heart. And it's the Outlast Trials. Mm. This is a super fun co-op horror experience that I cannot recommend enough. Myself and Andy have played it. I've played it with my friends and it is full of just screams and terror and fun puzzle solving mechanics. I'm really impressed with what this team made out of the Outlast IP and putting it into this co-op experience. I think we've seen a lot of great co-op horror games like Phasmophobia, Devour, of course, Dead by Daylight, if you start to talk about those style of games. But this game in the co-op genre is a ton of fun with friends. You can play it two players or up to four, and it is scary as can be. It has the Outlast, Outlast horror that you want and the puzzle solving that you got to do with friends is a blast so i want everybody do to we check want it out that, though, it's Mike. Awesome. do we want that i'm pretty sure i don't want that out last andrea in my life. you and i one full <laughs> night of just screaming it was awesome andrea i loved it and i definitely had to sleep with the lights on so it was well worth my time <laughs> and i loved that so yeah that's the game i've been playing past i saw you get excited about planet of lana do you want to say anything about that before yeah because we... because yeah, obviously I, w I wasn't able to be on last week you know when because i know you talked about it on kfgd but I, I, I just love that game. Like, I think your score was, was spot on. It's four out of five. This is, this is why I love indie titles so much. I mean, you know, the environmental puzzles, just the, the, just the, the visuals, the, the music, just everything about it, I just loved. I just so loved that game. Um, and to think that was their first effort from that studio. I'm blanking on the studio name, so I do apologize. But Wishfully, Wishfully. Studio, Wishfully Studios, thank you. Um, that's, that was their first effort out the box with that. So whatever they come up with next is immediately going to be on my radar because I really enjoyed my time with it. I think, you know, I think about five hours it, it took me, but what a great five hours it was. Yeah. Th these are the kind of games that I, I love to play. It was really good. And it's on game pass. I do believe, right? It's on, sure game it's on game pass for console and PC. Andrew, mm -hmm. I know you got a lot of games. Can you make a little four hour, five hour experience? Is this worth your time? What do you think? Absolutely. I like that. I like that. I can that. definitely make time for a, for a really fun indie puzzle platformer. That sounds great. Okay. Well, we're going to end the show with something fun because I've been very lucky. I've had a lot of my gaming heroes on the past couple of weeks. Of course, Ryan McCaffrey, someone who I've been listening to for over a decade who got me really into podcasting, him and Greg Miller. And now you, Andrew Renee, someone who has always been in front of the camera and got me excited to go onto the show floor and host live from the show floor. But unfortunately, 
E3 is gone before I could do such a thing. And you talk about the excitement, the planning, heading into Summer Games Fest and all the summer content that you and the team are going to be doing. Of course, we know Paris and Danny, they've been hustling for years. They've brought out the -the on-the-go recording setup. They've done podcasts from couches before, which I've always loved. But for you, Andrea, I've always seen you live on a show floor in front of a camera. What is now the difference without E3? Will you still be able to do that? Do you and your team have something different content-wise that we all can expect and enjoy to watch? What are you going to do? You know, we're still put bringing our plans together. And first off, thank you so much, Mike. You're so kind to say that. Like, it's I'm very blessed to have the amazing opportunities that I've gotten over the course of my career. And I think gaming media has fundamentally changed in the last five years even going into the last couple of e3s you could tell that there was just a little bit of a a difference in how things were going with publishers really taking the reins and wanting to have more control over their own message which i can't blame them for it just means that there's less opportunity for people like me in paris right who you know mm-hmm. have stood on those stages before um for the things that are coming up You know, Britt and I have talked about, you know, do we do these live watch alongs? Do we go to the in-person things and then do reactions instead? And it sounds like we're going to be doing the latter because there's so many people doing live reactions. It's really hard for audiences to pick and choose which ones they want to watch. But also, like, it's hard to watch the content when you're watching somebody watch the content. Um, and it's a, as you guys know, because kind of funny games is a lot of these live reactions. It's a really difficult balance of like, when do we jump in and talk about how we feel about what's happening on screen? And when do we just let the audience experience it with us? And that's something that I think is going to continue to be a creative challenge for teams who are going into these showcases. And I think Brittany and I are like, we miss being in person and seeing faces and having that theater moment like i still remember the gif i have of britney when they revealed resident evil 2 remake for the first time and i was sitting next to her in the theater and it was just such a fun moment that we are going to go try to capture some of those moments in these theaters and do then do reactions after the fact i like that i like that paris of course you know my first ever xbox showcase i got to see Britt and Andrea, and I know you were there as well. It was a pretty special time. Keanu Reeves came out. That was pretty oh, wicked dope. Such that was a great awesome. moment. But Paris, of course, you are always going to be one of my digital gaming dads. What's the plan for you this summer? And are you excited to see a bunch of people in person as well? I'm sure. Yeah, very excited. Um, I'll, I'll be at Summer Game Fest the you know the entire time you know from the from the YouTube YouTube theater show on the 8th uh, through play days obviously the xbox showcase um on on the 11th and ubisoft forward so you know i, I know kind of funny you know you guys are, are going to do the live reacts in studio so i'll be your man on the ground <laughs> in the trenches yes. during all that because you know I'm, I'm really excited to just see people it was great to see a lot of people last year because that was kind of the, the first time after the pandemic and i think even more people will be there this year so i mean i'm really looking forward to that and you know you know just doing my thing (laughs) out there, out there hustling. So it should be fun. Pretty exciting stuff. We are just mere days now away from everybody getting together to talk all things video games this summer. And most importantly, to talk talk about Xbox Summer Showcase. We will have a fun predictions episode next week. I want to thank Paris for joining me this week. And of course, one Andrew Renee for taking the time out of her busy schedule. She's the busiest lady in the biz. Andrea, of course, I know where I can find you. Where can everybody find you in the dope content that you're doing? Uh, the best place to find me is at Andrea Renee, either on Twitter or on TikTok. It's at Andrea Renee underscore on Instagram. You can find What's Good Games wherever you listen to this podcast. So we're put on pretty much all podcast platforms and at youtube.com slash what's good games. We are also doing our um, Magic 8 Ball predictions episode next week. So it'll be fun for us to compare our episode to yours, what your guys' predictions are. So if you guys want to help compare and contrast, you know, be sure to check out our show. I love that. All right. Well, with that, everyone, we are out for this week. We'll catch you back next week for our prediction. So make sure to write in kindoffunny.com slash XCast with your summer game predictions, and we will read them out on the show. Until then, goodbye, gamers.